a presentation today from Dr. Penny Ballam, our city manager, rec uh, that's regarding the policy report entitled Regulation of Retail Dealers Medical Marijuana Related Uses. And in this report, staff are recommending that related bylaw amendments be referred to a public hearing. So should council approve the recommendation, members of the public will have an opportunity to address council on this matter at that public hearing. But uh, given um, uh, this is both an update and a potential referral to public hearing, uh, there'll be a, a full presentation from Dr. Ballum and the opportunity for council to ask questions on, uh, on that presentation prior to considering referral. Okay, Count, uh, Dr. Ballum, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. And I think council, it is a bit unusual for us to make a presentation on a referral report. Um, just given the interest in this, I, staff wanted to make sure that you did have a chance to um, ask questions and clarify to inform your, your vote today, which is on referral, not on, not on the contents of um, our proposed regulatory framework. So, um, I'll just walk you through, Council, just a, a quick overview that actually, you know, I think is uh, well detailed out in the report. Um, there's, there's a long history going back to the, the availability of marijuana dispensaries and retail uses in this city. 1997, the BK, BC Compassion Club opened um, in Vancouver. And I think a major milestone was in 2001 when the federal government recognized the, the issue of the use of marijuana for medical reasons. And this is an area of medical science that has evolved over probably the last 20 years. Um, the earliest uses for marijuana were really to mitigate nausea for people undergoing chemotherapy. Since that time, the literature has expanded and there are a number of uses that uh, the medical profession have seen that marijuana actually can mitigate pain and chronic disease, um, nausea from various sources, and, and so on. So that actually, that regulatory framework allowed patients um, on the recommendation of their doctor to actually possess marijuana for medical reasons. So that went along, and you can see the curve, which, which reflects the number of marijuana-related uses at, at the retail level in Vancouver. And you can see it was a fairly flat curve, started to climb in about the mid-2000s. And then we reached an inflection point in the curve in 2012 when the federal government made steps to actually change the whole approach to making marijuana available for medical use. And they, they basically changed the regulatory framework, they, they changed the really significantly reduced the number of suppliers that were available to serve patients and they changed the the distribution construct in that these things had to be done online and by through the mail and they they created a price construct which was uh, you know significantly different from the way patients had been um, able to access marijuana for their medical use up to that time at the same time across the border, there were a number of states starting to look at regulating marijuana and Washington and Colorado actually took legal measures to allow people to use it for personal use and I think you know that over the last number of years there have been a significant number of states that have actually started to regulate this whole area um, related to marijuana in you know a very robust way and that's actually been some assistance to us in, in our work on this, this particular issue. Um, the, the federal legal framework that was changed in 2012 was challenged in the courts and there are a number of cases that are still pending and the final decisions have not been made but at this point in time the courts have sort of set aside the compelled use of a strict number of suppliers and you know so we're in a bit of a uh, limbo and that, that creates some real uncertainty for the city in terms of how we approach this. When you look at the curve from 2012 up to 2015, um, I think it's very, very clear that, that there is a huge amount of momentum, there's a, there's a growing critical mass of retail uses, um, marijuana related uses in the city and it's really because of this that the city in an interdisciplinary way has 
brought forward to council some steps to try and manage the issue because the number of, of retail units is growing on a, on a rapid basis. Um, in the last couple of months, we've added, you know, a, another significant number of marijuana retailers in the city and there, there is no legal framework for them at this point in time. And the city, as you know, is restricted. We, we do not regulate marijuana. Um, we do not have the jurisdiction to do that. But we actually do have the ability to regulate businesses operating in certain areas of the city. We can say where certain businesses can locate and where they can't locate. Um, we actually can regulate things like business hours, business requirements through the business license process. And it's through that window that we've come in to try and bring some order to this situation, to try and address some of the identified concerns, and also to protect access to um, people who need this for their well-being. This map actually shows you the distribution of marijuana-related businesses across the city of Vancouver. And as you can see, they're, they are um, throughout the city um, with areas where they're more heavily clustered than others. The vast majority of them are in retail commercial zones, but there are some that fall outside of that. Basically, um, over the last three years, we, we have struggled with uh, not just the proliferation of these retail outlets, but also, you know, their, their lack of compliance with some of the very basic bylaws that Council has passed and have been in place for many, many years in terms of how a business looks, their signage, um, what they can put out on the streetscape. Um, and, you know, this is a good illustration of uh, an outlet that you know, is breaking a number of rules in terms of our expectations about how a business should should carry out their their work. So just to reiterate, um, I think you know that the federal government is in charge of designating controlled substances and marijuana currently is a controlled substance under the criminal code and under the policy framework set out by Health Canada. They have set out the rules for medical marijuana. These are the, This is the issue that is in in question in the courts. Um, the police are responsible in our city, the VPD, and Crown Council for determining enforcement of the criminal code. And as I said, the city regulates land uses, we regulate businesses, and, and that regulatory framework for businesses allows us, as you, as you well know, you know, to decide locations, hours, you know, noise prevention, design, um, who is able to access those businesses, etc. In terms of the, just to take a step backwards and, and look at the issues around, because I think there's a lot of dialogue about whether marijuana is all good or all bad, um, or somewhere in between. And I think if you look at the, the research behind this, there are very clear benefits that have been well documented in the scientific literature for marijuana. Um, I can tell you as a, as a, as a medical provider, you know, in the early days when there, were, there was advocacy for the use of marijuana in the treatment of cancer, um, there, there was a lot of doubt and a, a lot of concern, but there, there's a growing amount of clear evidence and it's become normalized practice uh, at this point in time in the areas of oncology and the treatment of HIV with drugs that cause severe nausea. Um, other autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis, um, patients have appeared to have benefit with this chronic illness from some of the pain associated with that disorder. And there, there's some early evidence that it, it may be of help in some mental health areas. And also it's seen for people in the area of addiction medicine to, to be a substitute for more harmful drugs to, to mitigate some of the, the urge um, to use more um, problematic drugs like opioids um, and to also help people who have chosen to withdraw from from uh, harder drug use, um, it's, it has a very mitigating effect on some of the very disturbing symptoms of withdrawal from different drugs. There are concerns that, you know, I think are, are, have been well voiced and our regulatory framework really does its best to try and, and address both the, the access to marijuana because of the benefits, but also to address some of the concerns. And I think there's no question that the issue of youth exposure and, you know, is this, is this something that's creating the potential for early addiction in youth is something that I think many of our partners, you know, have some concerns about. And if you look at regulatory frameworks around North America, you know, ensuring that these are not, 
you know, close to youth serving um, community centers, schools is a, is a fundamental piece of the regulatory framework. And that, we'll speak to that later in the distancing requirements. There, there's also areas of the, of the literature as well that, you know, that documents that there may be some impairment of memory in people who are chronic users over a long time. Um, changes in psychomotor performance. Uh, you know, because marijuana is often ingested through smoking, um, we know that there are toxins in smoke, not just in tobacco smoke, and that there, there may be a predilection to oral cancers. Um, I think in terms of safety, you'll see that we've addressed in our regulatory framework some of these issues. You know, these are, there, there may be ties to organized crime in various ways um, in some of these retail outlets, and we, we have to be concerned about that. We know that a lot of the current retail outlets, because of their, their concern that they know they're not properly licensed, um, that they haven't come in and got the proper permits to do renovations and changes, and that can create real safety issues if they've done electrical upgrade or put in partitions that break the fire code or are inappropriate and not align with our building code. You know, these, these various bylaws are created to keep people safe. So um, the, these are other ways that it can be unsafe if it's not properly regulated. There are concerns that if you have too many of these outlets that they, they will start to have an erosive impact on local commercial neighborhoods. Um, and that's hence the reason that we've addressed some of the distancing between stores. And I think we've heard loud and clear from the BIA community that they feel that it's really unfair that that all their businesses have to get a business license, they've got to abide by the bylaw, they've got to get development permits, they have to go through community notification, and that these businesses that are now significant in number don't, don't have to abide by any of that. So really creating regulatory, um, you know, fairness is, is an important thing for the city to do. We have some very important partners that, you know, we do a lot of this work with, the school board, our health authority, um, obviously, the VPD, who have been, you know, very much a part of our team thinking and working on this over the last few years. Um, Vancouver Fire and Rescue, because the, some of the fire safety concerns and the fire, fire bylaw concerns are, are very real. Um, and the BIAs. And we have done, you know, obviously we have a fair amount of interaction with many of the people, at least operating these outlets, because we have inspected them um, over the last few years. Uh, we've identified ones that have done changes without a building permit. So we, we do have a relationship with many of these operators. Um, we have had, at this point in time, some limited outreach to them to discuss our plans for the regulation. And there will be, you know, ongoing uh, opportunities between now and the public hearing, if Council should refer this, to actually continue to discuss with them. And I think the message that they are getting back to us is they, they know that things would be much better for them on a number of different issues with a proper business license um, to, to be in a regulatory framework. Um, and they, they don't want to have a negative impact on the community. They feel they are providing uh, a needed service and they want to do that, you know, and stand up and be part of the rest of our business community. So we, we feel that there's, there's a lot of support for what we're doing and that doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with every little piece of our framework but we're very open to discussing with them. And I think, as you know, we can discuss later, there are, this is our, our initial phase that is based, grounded in best practice. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the fee and, and different aspects of it. And the regulation can be changed over time once it's evaluated and we understand the impact. So the, these things are not set in stone forever, but we believe that our approach has come forward with a very robust approach grounded in best practice and research from jurisdictions that are, are quite a lot farther ahead of us. So to that point, we've, um, Washington and Colorado are probably the states that are farthest along in terms of creating a regulatory framework. They have an advantage in that their states have been involved in um, establishing, you know, the broad state overview. And then the local governments have complemented that state uh, regulation with their own areas of jurisdiction so that they, ha they have a complementary framework. 
but their their experience and uh, the advice that they gave us was very very helpful. And you can see that their regulations involve you know three main areas that are relevant for us. First of all, what we call locational concerns, which is where where will we allow these outlets to be, and what are some of the other considerations around distance and and uh, adjacencies. So both of them have minimum distancing require, requirements from sensitive uses, which you know are obviously largely schools and things like community centers where youth do gather and, and get services from their local government. Um, Colorado has also embedded in their regulatory framework key distancing requirements from between retail outlets dispensing uh, marijuana. Um, the Washington state doesn't specifically do this, but, but through other mechanisms, they, they end up with, you know, um, really the end result that there, there, there will be some distancing between their outlets. They do define allowable zoning districts in both states, which is basically what areas of zoning in the zoning bylaw would actually, can you actually establish a business like this? So for example, we would not allow this to be established in an industrial zone. So, as you'll see, all, our zones are, are all retail commercial zones across the city. Um, there is actually a ban on co-location of different kinds of businesses. So this means that you can't combine your business with uh, some other activity. So you have to stick to the business of a marijuana-related use and not confound it um, with other things. Um, some of them have specific bans. So, for example, in Colorado, they, they ban the, the ability of a unit, uh, dispensary to set up in the downtown transit mall. Uh, you'll see we, we've considered some specific areas of the city where, notwithstanding, they, they are a retail commercial district that um, we're not prepared to let people establish. Um, in terms of safety and security, uh, they require criminal record checks of staff and, and uh, operators. Um, obviously, liability insurance in Washington State, different security features that we can go into in some detail later. Um, around business operations, things like limiting operating hours. Um, the issue of sampling uh, is something that the two states have taken a bit of a different approach to with Washington not allowing sampling. Um, both obviously ban minors and uh, the age is 18 years. They have a cap on the total number of dispensaries in Washington and they limit the number of licenses per person in Washington, and as you'll see later, that, that speaks to some of the issues around safety and security. So if you look at our overall approach to this, the city was looking for, you know, within the realm of jurisdiction that we actually have for regulation, our, our goal was to actually regulate these businesses and reduce the risks and impacts um, while allowing access to uh, people who, who are using marijuana for, you know, specific, their specific purposes. So youth exposure, serious crime, health and safety risks, the nuisance effect that, you know, needs to be watched, um, some of the aesthetic issues, the impact on the local economy, particularly with regard to clustering and a storefront that's not very tidy and unkempt. Um, and, you know, also location in a zone where we have very clear policy and bylaws that say, you know, industrial sites and zones are for industry and they're not for commercial retail. We do want to treat our businesses fairly um, and create some fairness across our regulatory approach. And we will, we're going to use permits and licenses, um, you know, building on our existing tools to actually accomplish this. So this graph actually, I, I just want to, you know, just take a bit of a pause here and just say that this has been a very complex um, piece of work by our staff. Uh, we've done a lot of anal analysis and scenario modeling, particularly in, in relationship to location and, and sensitive, sensitive uh, facilities where we, we want to have some distance. And it's not an easy thing to figure out, like, well, what does that actually mean as you, as you go to implement a framework? And basically, these bar charts represent a whole bunch of scenarios, just to give you an example, that look at you know, varying distances from sensitive uses and between um, at least the existing retail outlets. And you can see there's different, there's different colors in each chart. And on the left-hand side of the, of the graph are the number of marijuana-related uses that you could potentially 
you know, establish in the city given the distancing we chose for each of these scenarios. And you can see that the purple part of the bar, which is the upper part, would represent opportunity for incremental, um, you know, retail outlets. Uh, the, the, the red part is retail stores that currently exist that don't meet the distancing requirements we put into each scenario and would have to move um, or close. Um, if they're not able to find a location in an area that was that would meet our regulatory framework and the the blue at the very bottom of the curve represents stores that you know could actually stay in place because they would meet the various requirements and you can see there's a whole variety of of different um, you know different outcomes depending upon our our distances and I want to just say that you know, staff having done the research across, you know, much more experienced jurisdictions really felt that because, you know, we were moving into territory that was uncharted in this country, um, our, our plan was to stay with the best practice that we could find because, you know, that, that allows you to start saying you're, you're going to the benchmark and you're, you're trying to align with other jurisdictions and, you know, that's a good place to start versus looking at that and, and finding something that, you know, perhaps is in the middle. So in the end, we, we established about 10 scenarios that we thought were somewhere in the range of what we thought was appropriate. And you can see in this graph, um, you, you have the number of marijuana related uses on the left axis, on the horizontal axis, that each of those scenarios relates to the different distancing that we put into the model. And you can see the distancing from schools on the top rung, from community centers, um, child care centers, libraries, and each other, which is the sort of inter-use uh, distance. And essentially, staff is recommending to you one about in the middle there, which basically takes the 300 meters distance from a school, the 300 meters distance from a community center, which really doesn't speak to childcare or the library because in our, in our review we felt that notwithstanding there are youth that go to these places, that the major focused issues, and many of our libraries are actually now adjacent to community centres, that, that we could cover the, off the issues by just taking the two most sensitive areas, um, community centres and schools, and then, you know, fit with the benchmark for, you know, space between the retail units. So it's the 300, 300 and 300 option that you see there. And the impact of that is you can see that there, there, is, there are some stores that will be able to stay where they are. There will some that will have to move. And there is excess capacity um, that, that creates certainly for existing outlets that they can move and, and potentially if there are others that can come in, that creates the, the sort of overall capacity with across the city meeting that would meet these guidelines. And this map illustrates the commercial retail zoning districts and in teeny tiny font at the top of, the, of that map in the, uh, in the black background, you can see all the different zoning districts that we would have to um, change the zoning bylaw to allow this to, to happen but to put the distancing requirements in and, and that hence the reason why this is going to public hearing because the zoning bylaw requires a public hearing. In terms of the regulations that we're going to look at, um, essentially, you know, at the high level, we're permitting in commercial zoning districts, not, not, not residential, not industrial, and as you'll see, there are some specific things that I'll, I'll speak to later that we're, we're actually going to limit. Um, and that's really to prevent land use conflicts. This is, this is a commercial enterprise and, you know, we, we have very clear reasons why we create different zoning districts. And so like any other business, we, we want to make sure that they're not inappropriately in a district that is really designed for something else. The 300 meter minimum distance from schools and community centers is to protect youth um, and to provide some distance and it is based on the leading practice in Washington and Colorado. The minimum distance from other marijuana related uses is, is really designed to reduce the impact on what we call the clustering effect where you have, you know, a clustering of, of these outlets in, in one, in a series of a couple of blocks and you know, I think the, the growing experience is that does have an impact and there, there is a limit to how many of these you would want in a specific area. And we've built on the practice in Colorado. 
And then the, we, we are still looking at the consideration on other youth serving facilities because there are a lot in the city and it's not very clear. Um, you know, there are some organizations that serve youth and that may have an office function, but they actually don't serve youth there. So if you just go into the yellow pages and find out, you know, what are all the youth serving organizations, we have to really start to understand, you know, are youth actually coming to that location or is that just the, the back um, organizational office space and they're serving their youth out and about in other parts of the city. So that's an area where we will leave some discretion for our regula regulators. Um, whereas community uh, facilities, community centers and schools are, are obviously very, very clear. In terms of business licensing, this is where the, the city actually can regulate sort of how this business functions and, you know, our, our rationale behind this long list of different areas is, first of all, it's to protect youth, um, prevent crime, optimize security and safety, mitigate any nuisance impact, um, and support the aesthetics in the public realm, which are all important and, and common areas that, you know, we think about when we create business licenses for various activities. I'm not going to walk you through all these, Council, but they're there. Um, they're, they're well written up in the report, but you can see um, that we've tried to align all the different uh, regulations to, you know, to, with the overall principle of what we're trying to achieve. So, um, Based on the fact that we already have existing uh, outlets and businesses, uh, we, ha we have to design a, a framework that actually can be implemented in a fairly expedited way so that there's really no uncertainty. Like I think in fairness to these businesses, we, we want to create real certainty. We, we want to put them through an effective streamlined process in order to come into our regulatory framework and, and you know, become um, authorized within the city. So they we're going to require everyone to apply for a development permit and we'll give them, once council enacts the bylaw, um, there will then be a notification that will go out and we can presage that in conversations with these businesses. Obviously it's all subject to council approval of the bylaw, but our, our intention would be to establish a 30-day period whereby Anybody who's currently in play has to come in and submit an application for a DP. There will be a first filter that will be immediately placed on that application and that will be the distancing requirements from youth uh, serving or sensitive um, facilities. So that would be schools and community centers and we, we know all the, you know, where all those are obviously and if the stores don't meet that basic first filter then they will, they will be told they have to relocate or close, that they, they're not going to be able to carry on um, in that particular location. The next review addresses the, the concentration or clustering effect. And because you may have a cluster of three or four that actually meet the distancing requirement but are too close together, then you have to apply a methodology that, that is fair and very transparent. So we, we have, as you've seen in the report, a points-based system that actually you know, allows them to We'll put them through that points-based filter. Um, first and foremost, the, the one or two, however many could stay with and not create um, and, and still be within the distancing inter-business uh, requirements. The highest points will win the day and the others will have to move. And if we have some that are tied, and we will then do a lottery system that will you know, just make a choice based on, on uh, a lottery system. And then the final issue will be, um, you know, the compliance with the other bylaws, the building bylaw, licensing, health, fire, sign bylaw. Like in order for them to get a business license, they, they will have to basically align with all those different things. And I think that we, you know, we do know that these, these operators will work with us, uh, you know, if, if we make it very clear that they've got to comply. So that will be the last stage under which they can actually come out of this implementation system with a business license, a development permit, and actually be permitted to operate. So I've sort of walked through it there. Um, everybody's got to be in within 30 days and they've got to come in with the proof of a lease, that they actually have a location, 
that we can then do the, the primary distancing requirement from the sensitive issues. And this, this illustrates the point-based system for stage two when we're looking at the, at the concentration uh, of groups of these outlets that don't meet the inter, uh, inter-business uh, distancing requirements. So, you know, they, they, they start off with a total of 10 points and then, you know, we, we subtract points based on their lack of compliance. So if they are considered a problem premise by the Vancouver Police Department, then they'll lose four points. Um, if the premises actually have done work without a building permit, they'll lose three points. If the premise has been subject to more than one complaint from members of the community, then they'll lose a couple of points. And if they're not a nonprofit, because we know that in the early days of this, the, the nonprofits went into this to um, provide access to marijuana for people who are in medical need. And so we've given a point that gives them a, just a little bit of an advantage. And so out of that point system will come our decisions around the inter-outlet distancing. And then, as I said, if, if we've got people that are still there and have the same number of points, then we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll have a lottery. And stage three, as I said, is, you know, they have to do the work. We'll, we'll have to inspect. They're going to have to get their DP. That will require community notification. Um, their DP will be time limited and that's a common thing that, that we do in the city for sensitive, um, sensitive businesses that we, we require them to keep coming back to us and make sure that they're on their toes and they're honoring their good neighbor agreements and that they're, they're a business that's operating, you know, well in their local community. And that's something that, you know, allows us to integrate information coming in from our BIA colleagues and from the public to say, okay, well, over the last year, we've had all these complaints and these are problems. And it, it really, it, it's a way of keeping people on their toes and not thinking, oh, phew, I got through the lens the first time and then I'm, uh, you know, I'm on my way. And then the licensing fee, which the city has set at 30,000. Um, I think you've read some of the data in the newspaper and it is, it is a fee that is certainly the higher end of, of our fees. It reflects, it reflects the, the enormous amount of work that's necessary for us to implement this and to monitor it um, and to make sure it's safe. And so that's, uh, that's staff's recommendation. And just finally, you can see the timeline. Um, enactment would be day one, the application period up to day 30. Um, we, we, will, we have to make sure that everyone gets properly notified and there'll be a robust process for that. Um, the review stages will probably take somewhere up to you know, three to four months. And then we anticipate that we'll be able to issue DPs and, and um, business licenses, you know, at the end of three to four months. So in summary, Council, um, this is an area where it has become very, very clear to staff and especially our staff that are charged with, you know, regulatory uh, responsibility. Um, we, we, we have I think the city has watched this and, and we've, as you well know, we, we've taken a, a safety-based approach up to now where we've made sure that no outlet is operating and putting the public or their staff at risk in terms of the fire bylaw. The VPD have obviously been keeping a, a close watch on these and people who are, you know, really significantly putting the public or their staff at risk, they, they've taken action. But at this point, you know, there, there's too many and it's, it's too vague. And we, we need to bring this into the best framework that's possible under the circumstances. And just the rapid growth of these uses um, has, you know, triggered us bringing forward this proposed framework to you. We do have a number of tools and mechanisms that are extremely legitimate for us to use. And I want to reassure Council, we, we have a legal right to regulate land use, to regulate how a business operates. We're well within our jurisdiction to do that. And law has obviously worked with us to ensure that how we've approached this is aligned with that. Um, we have based this framework on best practice, um, especially when you start something that's new. That, that is the, the best practice way to start, is you got, you got to align with the best that's out there and, and build on that. Um, and we've done a lot of work with partners who have a real stake in this um, and who have come to us with concerns and I would say that we have good alignment with our partners in the school board and in health. 
The city's um, approach does strike a balance though. We, we are trying to take a very balanced and fair and very transparent approach. And the implementation of the regulatory framework, we're, we will put a, a team together that will be focused on this so that it's timely and that we're providing a very consistent approach. And you know, then that we can learn over the next two to three years to see how is it working, what are the issues, you know, and at some point in time, refresh and have a look at whether we've achieved our goals, whether there's things that need to be um, nuanced and, you know, how it's overall working. And that, that's sort of, that would be our approach. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and Council, I've got a great team here. Uh, Andrea Toma, who is our um, Chief Licensing Inspector. Um, Thor Coleman, who's done a huge amount of the background policy work and the research on this. Uh, we've got um, Mike Portia, Porteous from the VPD, who's been a terrific assistant to assistance to us. And I just want to say that, you know, the VPD and our fire colleagues have really helped, first of all, us manage this up to now and also provide an input into this framework. Um, Ian Dixon from law and our uh, zoning folks, uh, Jane Pickering and her staff that have actually helped us look at the zoning districts and how we can approach the changes to the zoning bylaw. So I just really want to thank them too. This has been a lot of work, lots of pressure. And I think over the last two to three years when this, this issue has really escalated, they, they've done a, a great job, I think, representing the city in terms of trying to manage it with, without a proper framework. And I think we're very clear and I'm very clear that it's time that we put something in place. So Thank you very, very much, much, Dr. Ballum, for the uh, comprehensive presentation <clears throat> and appreciate all the work that you and the whole team, staff team, have put into this. I just uh, want to recognize Patty Daly to our... Uh, yeah, I was just going to say uh, Chief Medical Officer Patty Daly is here from Vancouver Coastal Health. Thank you for joining us as well. Uh, I've got a list of councillors on the queue with questions. Uh, just to be clear, uh, we are considering referral of this to public hearings. So uh, basically the debate uh, uh, needs to be focused on whether or not council is referring this to public hearing and um, uh, the merits of doing that uh, and what, uh, what council would like to see come forward in addition to the, the report uh, for consideration by council and comments from the public at a public hearing. So. I'll just, I'll keep people on track with that, uh, but th we're not debating a, a, a decision or making a decision on this uh, report specifically, but it is about referring this to public hearing and any fine tuning and, and next steps that we'd like to see if we are referring this. Okay, with that uh, clear on process, I've got Councillor Jang first up uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, recognizing this is a referral to public hearing, um, uh, I, I would like to uh, move the recommendations to get it to public hearing because I feel that staff have uh, provided a good basis and I would really like to hear the public input on, on the proposed regulations. Uh, certainly over the past week uh, when this came out, I've heard a lot of, uh, a lot of things about the pros and cons for this and I'd like some more information at the public hearing. Uh, as staff see fit uh, to um, help inform my decision at that time because there's a lot of questions I have and I've got quite a few but I'll go through many as I can. So first of all, uh, one of the questions I have is uh, can staff at the public hearing explain the $30,000 fee and provide a, a better justification for it because it's just sort of broad right now but I'd like to see kind of a breakdown on that. Um, secondly, um, given the difference in scale between a nonprofit and a profit for-profit dispensary uh, with regard to that $30,000 fee or whatever fee council sees fit to, uh, to uh, uh, decide on, uh, is there a possibility of spreading it out, the payments for that fee as opposed to one $30,000 shot at once or over time um, to, to consider that? Uh, the other question I have is uh, the proposal currently says there's only one license per person. And I would like to know, uh, have, has staff considered the pros and cons of uh, a nonprofit having more than one, a limit, but maybe more than one, given that uh, some are nonprofits uh, historically in our city? Um, another question I have is uh, I've received from the general public, I'd like some uh, feedback on from staff, 
is uh, you talked about it briefly about exclusion around daycares and just a little flushing that out a little bit more. I know that you, you did provide here reasons why that wasn't included as one of the criteria, but just a little bit more information on that. Is it possible or even practical? Um, another one is uh, around exclusionary zones around sensitive housing. So for example, some of our shelters, winter shelters, I'd like some more information on uh, things like Covenant House, the Kettle Friendship Society, and the brand new building, for example, on Burrard, uh, the Quality Inn, or the Bosman. Is there any consideration of that as a zone I'd like some information back on? And um, generally, um, grandfathering. And I know that uh, a lot of folks have raised this question for me. For example, we have uh, we've seen situations where we, under the proposed bylaws, many would have to move. However, there are cases in which the marijuana dispensary, like um, the Compassion Club, predates the starting of a private school. And so did we take that into account, right? Because the school, for example, had moved there full well knowing what was there. And uh, just uh, was there any consideration of that? And those are the questions I would like uh, to see back at the public hearing. But uh, with that, I'd like to move the recommendations to take at the public hearing so that we can hear from the public. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Jang. And any responses while you've got Councillor Jang's window of time here? Yes, so um, a lot of those things we're happy to bring back uh, further information. Councillor Jang, I, I think a couple of things in terms of, you know, sensitive uses, um, you know, from just from the staff perspective, high level, obviously, you know, Council, part of the reason of going to the public hearing is for you to hear from the public and, you know, make your determination. But our you know, our approach, the complexity of, you know, the, the sort of gray areas of different sensitive uses and changing uses, um, our, our approach has been fairly uh, structured so that we're very clear of the sensitive uses that we're identifying. They're based on best practice. And, you know, we think that that, that will make a significant difference and it will be difficult enough to actually implement it. The more you bring discretion and judgment into that, it makes it much, much harder for us to be fair and transparent and actually to, to be able to, you know, make a decision. So we've actually thought a lot about those things um, and, you know, we're, we're happy to discuss it at the, at the public hearing. But I think our, our general recommendation that you've seen coming forward is that other than trying to define specific youth serving organizations, that, you know, the, the criteria that we're suggesting are, are going to create you know, a, a lot of movement uh, in the territory. And every time we add another criteria, it, it, it makes it much more complex. And in, in fairness to this sector, um, trying to make it transparent and fairly reasonable for them to decide, you know, is there, what are the sensitive uses that they have to adhere to, um, where our suggestion is, you know, pretty much stick with the best practice. Okay, I've got Councillor Carr next. Yes, um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks so much for the report and all the staff work on this. Um, I do ha also have a series of questions, and if you can add them at the or answer at the end, but these are bits of information that I'd like to see come forward for the public hearing. Uh, but my first question is actually around um, just speaking, the public speaking to um, this referral motion. Um, I've had a number of people ask me why they couldn't come and speak today to the um, to the referral itself, including some of the business improvement associations. Could you explain the rules around that? Um, I believe that's the procedure bylaw that a referral is council's decision and, and the public will have um, all the opportunity that, that you know, is inherent in a public hearing, uh, councillor, to actually provide their input. But, uh, so procedure, procedure bylaw says they, there's no speak, public speaking to a referral motion. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure the public was aware of that. Um, so in terms of um, uh, some of the information you provided uh, not being in the report, I'd like to see it included in the report and noted at the public hearing. For example, um, in, on page five, there's a discussion about um, enforcement and the Vancouver Police Department and the city's jurisdiction, and it's not clearly specified what you stated, which is that the police and the Crown Council determine enforcement of the criminal code. Um, the wording is more vague in the report itself. I'd like to see that much more clearly um, included in that report, or at least in the presentation at the time of public hearing. Um, secondly, um, in terms of the demerit system, you also said that the, the, 
that in, in this is the evaluation um, in stage two of the process if this should pass um, that uh, that a business will start at 10 and then go down in demerit points it doesn't say that in the report it just says that there are demerit points points and so it was confusing to me when it said they would have the highest points because it all sounded like they would be negative and I thought oh maybe negative eight is yeah we could clarify that you Council. that yeah. would I think that's important um, in terms of the permits um, like Council Councillor Jang, um, non-profits aren't specified in the permits. It just speaks to individuals and to corporations. Um, so if non-profits could be specified, then it's in what form you want to allow a non-profit to hold it if it's not an individual. It is an individual. That, that's our current proposal, that okay. it will be an individual, whether they're part of a non-profit or part of a private corporation that will hold the permit. Okay. I just and, uh, somehow I think some including some language about nonprofits in terms of the licensing because there are yeah. nonprofits okay. there. Um, in terms of um, the uh, location of, um, of activities, oh, sorry, just before that, impact on small businesses or on the local economy, that's in page eight of the report. It talks only about it being the kind of an impact on the uh, business atmosphere or character. And I have heard from business improvement associations that there's an actual business impact in terms of increasing rents um, in areas where the dispensaries are located. So if there could be some attention paid to the breadth of impact on small businesses, I'd, I'd appreciate that also. We can collect that. I mean, I think, Council, some of those things are difficult to document and, and show causation, but I think the observations, if the BIAs feel that, we're, we're happy to include that in a, in a yellow memo or some other mechanism. That would, that would be excellent. Um, um, getting close to the end of the questions, um, that the city um, uh, should take, page eight, take into consideration um, some of these other um, activities, youth-oriented activities, for example. Best practices, do point out, I mean, I think both Colorado and Washington State, which are what we're using as jurisdictional best practices, um, do include youth facilities, daycares, libraries, parks, um, for example. Mm -hmm. And your chart that, the, um, that you showed in your presentation that had um, the analysis of various scenarios, that's not in this report, but it does include some of those columns included how how it would shake down if we did license only allow licensing that didn't include daycares or libraries i noticed that there were columns like that can that information be provided i think that's very useful information to you modeled it yeah. right you want to speak to it sure um, um Andrew Toma here. Um, yeah. It's modeling that we've done based on the information that we have to date. Okay. We can't uh, certainly tell exactly how many stores and how many of these outlets are in Vancouver. Once the application process is through, right. uh, then we'll have a better idea. Um, but you know, again, it's it's modeling. It's based on our understanding and based on the information that we have. Um, we can certainly make it available for discussion at the public hearing. I think Absolutely, that would be, I think that would be excellent. And also, just some explanation of where it said must move, must stay, like there are so sparse. And I don't understand. And then what the opportunities are? I didn't understand if the if the bar graph said so many businesses would have to move but there was no capacity for extras. Does it still mean that there are locations within the city that we think would accommodate that number of dispensaries that um, may have to move because of the location being too close to one of these um, vulnerable? There still is capacity, okay. Yeah, there, it looks like there's still capacity, but you know, it, it does depend on available leases and, and that sort of thing. So. One final question, that's, and that's uh, about edibles. There's been a lot of discussion in the public about the Councillor Carr, I'm going to have to, you can come back on. Uh, I can come back on? Okay, thank you. I, you know, Mr. Mayor, I can speak to the edibles. It, it is, um, it's an issue we spent quite a lot of time on. The regulation would permit the um, purchase of oils that can be used for cooking, but there is a growing number of cases coming along of children um, because the, the edibles that are being produced now are very, very different from, you know, just the, the brownie that some of us grew up with. 
Um, and there they got jujubes and jelly beans and just about anything and everything. And, and the risk of that, you know, because there's tension, because, and I don't want to speak for uh, Dr. Daly, but I know that health would rather not have people smoking um, and that edibles mitigate the risk of the, of the smoking aspect of it. On the other hand, as they're available, um, there is currently no control over those um, and they, they do present a risk. So that's something that we, we spent quite a lot of time on and, and chose to say no edibles, but the sort of cooking components of it uh, can be available. Okay, I'll go to Councillor Meggs. Questions? Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, mean, I think that uh, it is a good basis to go forward. I do think that it would be helpful uh, from a couple of standpoints to have more information available at public hearings. So I'd just like to identify those areas that are of interest to me and I think many others. So, I, mean, I believe this council or the council of the day in 2005 endorsed the Four Pillars strategy proposal to call on the federal government to regulate the sale of marijuana. And there was a lot of analysis, both of the health aspects and of the criminal aspects of the status quo, but we're not in that world today. And uh, although it's not in the report, I'm hoping there will be uh, two things available at the public hearing. One is um, the ability to explain to council and the public the, the legal framework, which is referenced here, or the lack of a legal framework. I mean, we, we have a court process which is sort of stuck, I guess, uh, in the sense that there's been challenges and so on. And, that, and I think that the public is a bit confused, uh, and I would prefer to have some more information about this too, about why we see this takeoff related to that uh, legal situation, the circumstances. Uh, that's one area. The second area, which I hope um, Mr. Porteous and others can uh, speak to, is what the VPD's considerations are. Because when we hear the comments of federal ministers, members of the public honestly, you know, obviously will say, well, there simply, there simply should be enforcement. Uh, and the VPD is responsible for that. So I hope that at the hearing we'll be able to get some more information about the VPD's considerations and whether or not there were policy issues that were left on the table, and especially whether or not uh, the VPDs are the view that um, the organized crime aspect of the larger illegal marijuana industry is uh, going to be assisted or hurt by this approach. And I think the public will want some information on that. So I'm hopeful that uh, a public hearing we can hear some more on, on those topics if, uh, if that becomes an issue. That's great. Yes, we will do that. Okay, Councillor DiGenova next. Thank you very much. I just have a few questions. Perhaps some of them could be answered today and others at public hearing for information. I'm just wondering in the uh, guidelines that you've set out for how, how applicants would apply for this, is it possible to require the financials and also the suppliers and growers associated with these shops? I don't see that in the framework. I'm also wondering if reviewing annually is enough, especially as this is something we're just starting. You know, change can happen quite quickly. Uh, I, I'd very much like the opinion on the VPD and the city um, as to how often we should be uh, checking in with uh, any shops that are uh, meeting our regulations and deemed to be okay. Uh, also, I'm just wondering, uh, on page eight of the report, I'm looking here, it, it states that Washington allows three to five outlets per 100,000 people. And just looking at uh, the population, the city of Vancouver has 603,000 people and the city of Seattle has 652,000 people. They allow for 20. I'm just wondering if the proposal for 80 could possibly, if that could come to public hearing as to why 80 was chosen or is there a possibility of sort of lowering that number and then as we go through this process over years or whatever that might be, uh, increasing that number. I'd like to hear from city staff and also the police department on that. And I'm also wondering, I understand from reports in the media that uh, Mayor Robertson did receive a letter from the health minister, uh, Rona Ambrose, uh, stating that, uh, you know, the guidelines for medical marijuana uh, do not allow this legal substance to be regulated by municipalities. So I'm just wondering if we're putting ourselves in any legal risk or situation here at the city as we do have a fiduciary responsibility to the city of Vancouver. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Uh, maybe I can just address a couple of things. Um, the issue of 80, we, we have not, we, we did consider a cap on the number of retail uses in the marijuana related in the city and we decided not to that that the the zoning requirements the distancing requirements would actually create a natural cap and so we we didn't actually do that and 
it, it remains to be seen. You can see we've modeled, these are theoretical models, we modeled the capacity, but you know, if you put into that the issue of available leases and rental space in, the, in retail commercial zones, um, it's not clear at all where we'll actually land. We did look at the per capita issue. We, we know that Seattle's approach um, results in uh, about 20 in the, in the city of Seattle. Um, Colorado, if you, they don't have a, have a per capita number, but if you look at their distancing requirements and in our conversations with them, it comes out somewhere between about, I think, 12 to 15 per, per 100,000. Um, so, you know, we're, at least we're in the zone uh, closer to Colorado from our count. Um, you asked another question that I was going to uh, answer. I just can't remember. But in any case, Thor's written them all down, and we, we will address them. Is, do you remember any of the ones we can answer? And as I have, I have a little bit more time, yeah. Mr. Mayor, I just have one more question. I'll I'm read wondering it. if the stores don't meet the requirements and they fail, however they continue to stay open, what would the time be uh, for the city to be able to shut those down? And also, uh, what power does the city have to mm -hmm. shut those shops down? Okay, so I, I know the question you answered. Could we... You know, are we going to be reviewing them more frequently? And I, I would say, as you saw from the slide, once we get through the implementation and we have the businesses that are permitted, <clears throat> then we will have ongoing enforcement that will certainly, we won't wait another year to have a look at them. We, we will be monitoring things very, very carefully. What I was really referring to was, you know, would we bring back the regulations for, for a look um, similar to the way we've done that? in different areas of business of the city where we start something new, we have a look at it, we make our best uh, first steps and then come back and look at it two years down the road to see does it need adjusting. But certainly in terms of enforcement, we, we have an interdisciplinary team that will be active. Um, and in terms of the, you know, the process, um, we laid that out in the report. It's in, we have an awkward process, I think that's clear. Um, we have the ability to ticket. Um, we have the ability to come to council and if we have a business that hasn't cooperated to seek an injunction to take them to court to close them down. We know from property use uh, infractions that it takes a while. You, you, sometimes you can get a court order and we still can't have a, a property to, owner to clean up their property or close down their business if it's illegal. But, you know, we will, there are, there are different ways that we can expedite if we've got a problem premise that's not meeting our framework. and. Um, but it's it's not as easy as just going in and shutting it down. Yeah. Unless, of course, you have a fire bylaw violation that's a life safety thing. In in the sitting of life safety with our regulatory framework, that's where we have the, the most power um, to actually shut a business down and, 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 and force it to vacate. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Stevenson next. Thank you very much. Uh, well, there's a lot of questions, isn't there? Um, just on the point that you're uh, mentioning about uh, inspecting, does this mean we're going to have to up uh, the number of staff uh, substantially? Because all of a sudden we've got 80 of these places, or however many, and uh, and uh, we don't we certainly don't have the staff to handle that now. So what will we do on? The uh, so I can address that. Uh, we certainly don't have the staff currently to address the full enforcement that would be required. Um, again, the application process will be open for 30 days to all businesses wishing to uh, apply for this use that would meet our zoning criteria. Um, I think the enforcement, uh, the team that would be dedicated would have to be an, a, a bit of an integrated enforcement team that would have to cover the building side. Okay, I, uh, that's, that's good. But, uh, but that means we're going to have to up the budget, or is that 30000 going to cover all these inspectors? The 30000 fee is, is covered into that. So so what happens if we don't do anything at all? Um, we just decide no, uh, and we carry on this way. What's, what's the trajectory? Is there any way that we can tell the police, or the police will go and say, well, we want to close up all 80 of these? I mean, I, we're getting emails from people saying, why don't you do something about this? So why haven't we done something? Now, you might want to bring that to the hearing. I, you know, I don't need to. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Council, we've, we've been in a position where we had very little in the way of powers, and, you know, we, we consider that we, we need to have a regulatory framework that, you know, at least within our jurisdiction, that allows us to take some action and make sure these businesses are aligning. If, if we don't do anything, then, you know, we're... We're, we will get more of the same, I assume, and it will become more of a problem. You'll get more complaints. And Why can't the police deal with it? Well, I think that, you know, that's something I maybe I'll ask 
Mike Porteous to, to address? Well, no, I, I think that's a question for the hearing. Really. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's We're a, happy to bring it back. It's going to be a larger question. Now, I understand that you can't, uh, the, these dispensaries won't be allowed to have ATMs inside them. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Well, why wouldn't you want the poor person to get the money so they can pay the bill? I'm going to let our, our regulator, ATM is another business. It's yeah. based on our research that 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 isn't a helpful thing to have. It's another business use in the in the retail outlet, and it's not something that we think would be appropriate at this time. Okay, uh, I think we'll need to we'll want to go into that a bit more. Uh, too. Uh, I have four grandchildren: three, six, eight, and ten. Can I take them into the dispensary when they come to visit me, so when I get my? No, no, you can't. Why not? We would, because it's against. It's going to be against our regulation pending and subject to council's approval. No minors under 18. Okay. Sorry, counselor. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave them outside. <laughs> um, unattended outside. <laughs> yeah, unattended. <laughs> so uh, on the medical side now, doctor. Yes. On the medical side, because you know a lot about this area, you and I and others have watched people have uh, drinks and too many drinks and far too many drinks, and then they get violent and, and things happen, and we read about all this in the, play, in the paper all the time with problems. Is that also applicable to marijuana? Do people uh, get violent at all with this stuff, or is it just uh, how they become passive with this stuff? Is that a problem for us? Violence coming out of it's you know. it's a it is a it's it's a different um, substance. It has quite a different impact on the brain, um, you know. And it is it's sedating more than anything else. Uh, and people do slow down and they become a bit more passive if they've you know if it's chronically used. But it is um, you know it has a very different impact than alcohol. I know uh, I've got a few, a few seconds. I have a family that has had a terrible problem with a schizophrenic son for many years. They blame it on uh, his early use of marijuana starting in his early mm -hmm. teens. Is that possible? You noted schizophrenia. Is, is that possible or is that a condition that might just be aggravated by it? Either I'm, I'm not. I, I don't feel I have the expertise to speak to that, but we can certainly get that information and, and have a look at the science and have our health colleagues provide us with sort of a summary of where the evidence is on that, Councillor. Okay, Councillor Deal is next. Thank you very much. Uh, again, these are questions that can be answered at the public hearing. Thanks for all of your work on this. Um, some of what we're trying to do here is make sure we have facts on the table and as much information and data as possible so it doesn't become an emotional discussion. So some of, these, some of the facts that I'd like to see a little bit more of in the public hearing presentation are around the complaint side of things. Um, what are the current statistics around complaints both from citizens, from the BIAs, the Business Improvement Associations and the VPD around these uh, uh, outlets that are currently in the city? And we can get a little bit more uh, information around the insurance. That question gets asked a lot. Are they eligible? What can they get? What are we requiring, which is in the report? Just a little bit more in information around that insurance side, because that question does come up fairly often. And then uh, trends in certain neighborhoods. If we were not to put these spatially related um, constraints in place, would there be trends towards certain neighborhoods? Do we, would we imagine that whether it be the downtown east side or Commercial Drive or, or West Forth or wherever it is, would we start seeing more clustering and is, and is this going to sort of make it more of an even distribution around the city? So those are some things I'd just like to see a little bit more factual data on as we go into the public hearing. Yeah. yeah, we can do that, Councillor. I think your last question is pretty tough for us to understand the dynamics. But what we'll, if question, yeah. We'll, we'll have a look at that. Yeah, if you can't, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ball next. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the staff. Um, governments roll over very slowly like elephants, and I remember as a child uh, seeing uh, liquor stores from the outside and there was a little sort of a gated place where you came and people would write down what they wanted and it would be slipped out to them and then a few years go by and you see something else. You could see the liquor, that was okay, you were still signing for it, signing your name and then gradually we came to stores. So the federal government, I, I believe, um, 
it, and in everything that I find written on the federal government websites and everything are in charge of drugs in Canada. So this being a federal issue, uh, I wonder if it's possible for you to make sure that the federal government regulations, which as they ex currently exist, and which I have read a number of times in many places, allow marijuana for medical purposes to be used uh, for only when prescribed by a doctor or a nurse practitioner. It can be obtained through using plants if you were grandfathered uh, before the uh, latest court stay, and, uh, and you can currently um, obtain it through uh, that license, through the doctor's medical doc documents, through mail. And I would really like to see what is, what is uh, possible actually in the report. Um, and all other retail outlets that are operating currently are illegal under our federal laws. And I think that that is something that it's important that when we're considering these issues that we actually know what's really out there. So if that could, if we could actually have what is, is really there. So my first question, and I've had this question come to me from a number of people too, has the city requested an exception to the current law in order to allow retail operation of marijuana for medical purposes? Has the city done that? So that, that would be one of the questions. And um, is it, as the, all of these operations are currently illegal, and as Councillor Stevenson asked this too, why did the city not stop the, the very quick pro proliferation of the um, illegal outlets? Um, and why were they allowed to operate and open right across from schools, close to schools, close to libraries, and close to daycares? And that has been asked a number of times, and if that could be addressed. Um, as we all believe that the country is changing and, and moving forward, and I understand why this framework has been put in place, because many people understand the need for people who are in pain to be able to uh, acquire medication. However, who once this framework is in place, who will be responsible for any uh, adverse effects uh, on, uh, again, patients with bipolar, patients with schizophrenia, who have never actually felt any of those effects until uh, they're affected by marijuana? Who's, who, who takes the, the responsibility here? And um, in moving forward, I am not speaking against anything. I'm asking the questions that have come to me. Um, in terms of working with the federal government and the provincial government, what is the process in bringing, involving them? Because again, legally, we have to uh, deal with both those levels of government. So those are the questions that I have. If there's any time to address any of them now, fine. But I understand this will be going to public hearing and it would be helpful to, to hear those answers. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Ball. Maybe, maybe just a couple of things. Um, just to be very clear, the city does not have any jurisdiction to regulate um, marijuana. And if you if you think about some other parallels, you know, we regulate hospitals in their land use. You know, they have to get a business license. They they've got to follow certain things about you know traffic and all, all kinds of things. But what goes on in that hospital is, is not our purview. So if you've got somebody practicing the wrong kind of medicine without a license, that's not up to us to regulate. And this is a little bit similar. We're regulating you know, where these businesses are and what they're doing, but we are not regulating the sale of marijuana or how somebody actually access it. We actually have, that is where we have no jurisdiction. So we'll, we'll try and um, sort of map that out a, a little bit more comprehensively um, prior to the public hearing. Okay, Councillor uh, Affleck is next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I have lots of questions, but I, you know, I'd like the answers today, and I'll, I'll ask them one at a time, and you can answer each one of them, and we'll see how many we get through. Uh, on page, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to refer to the report specifically so that uh, it's clear. On page four, um, uh, it says marijuana must come from an authorized source. Uh, and 
So I'm just curious, uh, what is, how do you define authorized? Uh, and, uh, you know, is, uh, are they legal sources? And if they're not legal sources, or how many of these are unauthorized potentially now? Do we have any idea uh, how much of the marijuana coming into these uh, stores is legal or illegal? So um, at the end of the day, the, the supply to these stores is not anything that the city really has a jurisdiction over. And our understanding from talking to some of the operators is that they are, they are getting their marijuana from people who have licenses in the past regulatory framework with the federal government to grow marijuana for patients. Um, but it's, it's not something that we are proposing to regulate because it's very difficult for us. It's, it's not our area of jurisdiction. And you kind of refer to that to, to Councillor Ball. So, for example, then if, if a, a bar or a restaurant is uh, buying uh, alcohol uh, from an illegal source, uh, uh, somebody who's brewing it themselves in their basement and then selling it to them and, uh, and, they're, and they're pouring it into drinks, and we're not going to do anything about that as a city, whether it's the police who we have, uh, who uh, the mayor sits as the chair of the board of the police, we're not going to do anything in that situation. We're just going to sit back and let that restaurant or bar continue to sell illegal alcohol. Well, I think the regulatory framework, Councillor, doesn't, doesn't address that aspect of things that, you know, if, if there's illegal, um, somebody brewing alcohol and is prohibited under the criminal code, that, that is the jurisdiction of the police. Um, I, I think it's, you know, the city itself does not instruct the police on, on these sorts of things. Those are decisions that they make within their organization um, and, you know, their framework. But at the end of the, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to get, yeah. So, and that, you know, the, the area of liquor regulation, we, we have a certain responsibility in the area of regulation of liquor, but most of the, of the um, area of responsibility sits with the province. So, you know, that would probably, that in combination with the criminal code would be the area that would go after something like that. Okay, so in this case then, potentially, uh, I'm not quite sure of the roles and responsibilities, uh, if, if this passes, goes through public hearing and passes, uh, we're taking, uh, having a blind eye to what's going on in these operations. Then, and, and, and we haven't, the city of Vancouver's police haven't done anything uh, to this date really on any of these facilities. Uh, would the R RCMP get involved at that point? Uh, with the federal government's position on this clearly stated to us in a letter, uh, what potential impact might their attitude uh, towards this have on the operations if it's uh, approved? Will they come in potentially and say, you know what, we're shutting them down? Does your RCMP have that authority or do they leave it to the Vancouver City Police to take care of to enforce uh, the laws of the country? I am, like I think obviously our city police have jurisdiction uh, over the criminal code in the city of Vancouver. Whether there are divisions that are, um, have, would have overarching jurisdiction, I don't believe so. Um, there are integrated enforcement around organized crime where VBD work with the RCMP. But I, to be honest, Councillor, I, I can't specifically answer that because our regulations are, are they're, they're complementary to, to any of that. We, we're establishing a regulatory framework in the areas of business, how no, business I know. I, operates, I, 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 and I, land use. I only have a couple of minutes, one minute left. So who gives the city of Vancouver's police's marching orders if there's illegal activity happening in this city? Well, the chief of police and, um, you know, the solicitor general um, and uh, um, the police board is responsible for the administrative oversight of the police. So the, the provincial government, federal government, uh, and the chief of police and, and the board of, of the police could say, even if we authorize all of these, nope, shut them down. Shut them down now. Uh, they're illegal. Uh, if they are, in fact, illegal, by the sounds of it, uh, and maybe you can answer this question, uh, yes or no, uh, are there illegal drugs in these, uh, in these current locations? So I, I think the issue of the police, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak to. That, that is something that I'll ask Mr. Porteous to speak to, that the, you know, the approach of the VPD, they've, they've been quite clear around that. And, and you, either we can do that today or at the public hearing, Councillor. Okay, uh, you talked about uh, in your report on page 5, community support. Uh, uh, do we have any, I mean, what, what is that, that doesn't actually define what community support means in that reference. Uh, do we have some polling that supports this? Is it just a feeling that we have that the people of the city support this? Where does the community support, as it was referred to on page five, uh, come from, from staff? Well, I think, Kelser, we, we've, 
as, as you do, we, we get a lot of correspondence from the public that, you know, staff manage. Um, we've talked to the BIAs and, and, you know, we've talked to the school boards and, you know, they work with parent networks and we've talked to our health authority who interact with, you know, thousands and thousands of members of the public. And I think, and, you know, we, we track the media and the conversations that, that happen uh, on talk shows and everywhere. So, um, and we have information coming into 311. And, and what we know is that for sure, um, there, there is, you know, there are, there are two major sort of themes here. One is something needs to be done to, to manage this situation and, and start to, um, you know, start to limit just the, the rapid straight up curve growth of, of these outlets. And, and that there, there's, a, there's a significant recognition in the public that marijuana is definitely a mitigating substance when people have chronic disease and chronic illness and in some cases different kinds of addictions. There are also, obviously, through some of those very same organizations, so there is support, but they have also concerns. And that's why I say that this whole framework is designed to be balanced. It's designed to balance those concerns and the support and the rationale behind why, why would the city, you know, not just take steps to try and shut everything down. And that, that's the, the principal basis by which we've come to this recommendation to Council. Okay. Time, but I hope we can that's get your time. On. Thank you. So we'll go... Uh, any uh, final follow-up questions? I've got the motion on the floor, so maybe uh, if you keep your questions germane to that motion and uh, indicate what you're going to do on the motion, that's uh, we'll have one final round specific to the motion and any last questions. Councillor Carr. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I have two um, two questions. I'm actually going to, instead of following up on the edibles, which I'd like to do, um, just follow up on the comments that were just made by Councillor Affleck um, around rationale. I, I actually noticed that this report is missing a rationale. Um, so I'm wondering if that could be included um, at the public hearing. Um, you've spoken to it. And I think it was in your summary, um, Dr. Ballum, where you talked about a variety of issues and, and just in the most recent comments included the fact that there is a rationale based also on um, some stated, I don't have the data for it and it would be good to have it, but some stated um, indication that the public is more supportive of a permissive or more permissive approach, but has concerns. I think I'd like to see those outlined clearly. You've stated verbally um, concerns around uh, rapid growth, um, there's health and safety concerns, there's impact on business, there's vulnerability, vulnerable populations and youth. If we could have that rationale clearly presented, you don't need to do it now, You've, it's been bits and pieces today, but for the public hearing, I think that that would be um, a very good so Councillor. Um Happy to do that, but I just want to refer you to the report where we've gone to quite a lot of lengths to actually talk about, you know, the, the different kinds of concerns and uh, the, if you look at page seven on the report, um, and, you know, if you, if you go through and, and talk about why, why we're here, we, we do express the fact that the public, you know, that there are a variety of different things some concerns over the benefits or some support around the benefits and, and some concerns around the risk. I'm just trying to find that. You know, I, I, the, there, are, there are points scattered through this report. Um, I'm looking for something that is a comprehensive summary um, that relates to the rationale for us proceeding down this path. So a listing of all those reasons which have come up in a variety of places that simply allow us to then know what the priorities are in, in proceeding forward, if it's health and safety, if it's impact on children or mitigating the impact on children and vulnerable populations, if it's mitigating impact on businesses, if it's, you know, concern around buildings that have been renovated without building permits and they're unsafe, you know, if not, it's not summarized. And I'd like to see that summary. I think that would be a helpful context. Great. Thanks, Thank Councillor. Um, secondly, in terms of the edibles, um, my understanding is that from a health perspective, it's, it's a preferable form um, to, to take uh, marijuana, um, but uh, there's, 
I need an understanding in this report or to the public hearing of why it's not possible um, for us or why it's not advisable for us to allow the sale of edibles. And particularly, I'd like to know um, if Vancouver Coastal Health, they may not want to do this, but if Coastal Health has the ability to um, enforce content, labeling, um, all of those, the kinds of things that we may have concerns around. Is that possible? Or is it, it's, if it's not the city's responsibility or authority, and it's not Coastal Health, whose authority would this be? Right. So, uh, um, to my knowledge, Councillor, our legal staff, knowing that, that there is an answer to that, nobody has the authority to actually do that at this point. And you know, we can certainly will bring examples of what what the concerns are and the balance that we've tried to achieve by allowing the availability of cooking ingredients, um, but not moving all the way to an end product. Yes. In, in the store. Why? Why the oil? Not other things. Yes. Um, and if you say no one has a jurisdiction, that's hard to believe. Somebody must have the jurisdiction. Is it just because there's a legal? Well, it would be the federal government, right. ultimately, yes. But it's not Vancouver Coastal. It's not Vancouver Coastal. No. I don't believe so, anyway. Dr. Bailey? We do inspect all food service establishments. And one of the things we do require is that for Product, food products that are sold, that there is a list of ingredients. So right. we do get the occasional complaint. We had one just last week around some of these outlets that they're selling edible products that are not labeled. Right. And the concerns are, what's the dose of marijuana? Right. What if there are other ingredients, for example, if you have a nut allergy, are there nuts in it? And we are actually, I've instructed my staff to inspect those facilities right now because regardless of whether or not this is a legal or illegal product, we would certainly expect them to follow those standards. Now, these are places without... Uh, permits to, to sell these foods, so that's an issue. Just to get on the larger issue of edibles, uh, the con we have concerns about edibles too, and it's not just because there's a, these products aren't labeled, it's because of the pharmacokinetics of edible marijuana that um, uh, the impact is delayed. So what we've seen in the literature is that people who consume edibles, particularly if they don't know how much is in them, uh, will often are those who suffer overdoses. You've heard about some of those who came to our facilities on, on uh, 420, and so they may be more harmful in that sense. I think the right balance is to have something like oils that people can incorporate and know the dose in their own edibles, but I do have concerns about the pharmacokinetics of edibles, the fact that the products are appealing to children and youth, and we've heard of overdoses in the U.S. related to that, so we need to strike the right balance. Great, thank you. Um, this kind of Councillor Carr, um, important you're, at the public hearing. Thank yeah, you, Mr. I think we're, we're getting, again, into the territory where information needs to come to public hearing. Uh, should council decide to do that? Because I've got a lot of councillors back on the queue with uh, more questions. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak specifically to the merits of referring this to a public hearing where we can have all this information uh, and more presented to council and the members of the public will have the opportunity to speak and be part of that. So with that in mind, uh, Councillor Jang, your referral. Well, I uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did, uh, in, in fact, move the recommendations to uh, get to this point. Uh, just two very quick questions to come back. Um, I don't want any explanation now on uh, the implementation of if should this all pass the implementation of the business license program. Uh, there are some places with leases, long-term leases, and how that you know how that would impact them essentially. And uh, a lot of discussion currently we're hearing is in polemics. Why don't you you know do this or do that or you know what happens if you wipe it all out or you just shut them down immediately? So uh, any kind of background from Vancouver Police and our staff on what happens with prohibition, for example, if we were to prohibit it all did what the minister said, what would happen? What would be the impacts of that? Is it worse or better than what we're doing now? Thank you. Okay. And Councillor Affleck, to the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Just to be clear, so we're asking a couple of questions and then we wrap up and say whether we support the motion. Is that what the plan is this here at this point? Yep. Or are you, but is there gonna be keeping round? your questions to the, to the question of referral, not the broader topic. And then we're wrapping up after this round. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just on again to the point uh, that I've been up and Councillor Carr brought up, uh, generally in a public hearing with a, say a, a development, we'll get the data on how many supported, how many didn't support, uh, any kind of statistics that might exist uh, to, to provide us with clarity and an understanding. So if there is any uh, public support uh, information that we might have, whether, whether it's polling, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, you didn't answer my question though, whether or not, uh, with a yes or no question, which was uh, whether or not 
uh, any of this uh, currently, uh, the marijuana is procured illegally, uh, yes or no, uh, in the current system? Um, I don't know whether, Mike, do you want to answer that? Vancouver Police. The uh, currently possessing or trafficking marijuana in Canada is illegal unless there's, so it's been supplied by the federal government usually through mail or your license to grow it on your own. But the, the catch-22 in this current situation is, is that law is under appeal. So it, it sort of, to a certain extent, it puts us in a little bit of limbo. So, but technically that marijuana that's coming into those dispensaries is Mostly illegal. Mostly illegal. Illegal, yeah. And I would assume that we would be, because we're in the middle of the process, uh, this appeal or this uh, legal process federally, that the old law laws apply, correct? That, that we just stick to the old laws until that uh, court case is completed? Well, technically right now, the new law applies, but it's, it's, it's under appeal so that the, the Supreme Court has, has said you can operate until we decide, or, or at least... Um, the so Public Prosecution Service of Canada is sort of taking that stance to a certain extent. But I don't want counsel to be confused to think that the police don't do enforcement on, on these shops. If, they're, if it's aggravated or it's not in the public interest or there's a level of danger or organized crime or risk to children, we will do enforcement. We will arrest, execute search warrants, recommend charges to Crown Council, and Crown Council is approving those charges. But there's a lot of logistics involved with that because of Health Canada and laboratory testing and things like that. No matter which way you slice it, new law, old law, the basic law is there has to be a direct relationship between the consumer or the person who uh, has the health need uh, and the supplier via a doctor, correct? Whether it's uh, the, the change in the federal law is really about corporatizing, corporate, corporatizing the whole system, creating big, giant, grow, growing operations as opposed to, uh, and, and is that not correct? So the, that it doesn't matter the way the, the, the law federally uh, it's still you still procure, you procure uh, as in your health from your through your doctor to a supplier, correct? Yeah, if you're going to be legal, you need a, 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 a note from your doctor or your health pr practitioner to obtain marijuana. The supply on it to, to answer the, the back end of your question is, is the, the supplying is the is the area where it, it's basically suspended right now, pending the court decision. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question regarding. Um, uh, the limbo we're in between uh, today's decision uh, and the public hearing, are we putting a moratorium on any new uh, operations? Uh, are we going to shut them down? Are we just going to kind of let them keep expanding until we have the public hearing? What's the process right now after this meeting today? Well, at this point, the, and Councillor DiGenova will, will uh, know about this because we, we do have, uh, we've had some outlets that have opened um, in some cases where we know that they wouldn't meet the distancing requirements. And, you know, what the city staff have been instructed to do is tell them, you know, don't go investing a lot and you, you need to close down. We've been ticketing because we are trying to, to limit what's going on now uh, pending council's consideration of this regulatory framework. So, you know, we are, we, we do receive reports from different, um, you know, different sources from members of council, from the public, and we do go out and investigate, and we are trying to discourage new entities from actually opening up at this point, particularly if they're opening up and clearly they're not going to meet the requirements. Thank you. If I just yeah. may close, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I'll wrap up. Brief, very briefly. Yeah, brief. yeah. just, just two other things uh, for the public hearing that I was curious about. One is the uh, defining uh, the police information check and what's involved in that. What are we looking for? Some more detail on what that actually means. Uh, and then also uh, the 30K, we've had a, several emails, people saying that perhaps somebody, some of that $30,000 could go towards uh, education, uh, something to think about, education programs, uh, programs to help us uh, not see the growth, uh, with, especially with youth. Uh, given uh, the answers, but I, I do know there's lots of questions today. Uh, I see staff furiously writing uh, all the questions that we've had down. Uh, I do worry about that when there are so many questions, two rounds, that hasn't happened very many times in the four years that I've been here. Uh, so uh, that does concern me with regards to this report and referring this report. However, I'm confident that staff will work really hard in answering all these questions because I think this will be a challenge for us in public hearing. Uh, we're going to have a lot of people, I'm guessing, we're already a lot here today and we're not even in the public hearing process. And I'm sure it'll be on both sides of the spectrum uh, and of the issue. And so I would uh, really hope that uh, the answers that uh, the questions that we've asked today 
will provide us with a lot of clarity and understanding of, um, to help all of us make a decision after we've heard from the public. So I'll support the referral, but I am uh, worried about all the questions that have come up today, and I look forward to seeing specific answers to those questions. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Stevenson to the motion. Thank you very much. Well, one thing for sure, there will be a moratorium on anything that we can say after this passes. Once it goes to public hearing, no councillor is allowed to speak on the matter, so that's a, that's a moratorium. Pointedly, yes. Um, just uh, one quick Follow-up question I had is, do you know how many um, medical marijuana folks there are in Vancouver? Have you got any estimate to the population and <coughs> therefore the need for 80 of these uh, shops to, to supply these people? <coughs> I don't have the answer to that. No answer. Sorry. Can we get that? I think we'll, we'll have a look at. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, I'm very much in support of this moving uh, on to uh, public hearing. Um, I think that there will be a large number of people obviously uh, speaking um, <clears throat> with uh, different positions, but I think it's uh, time that this uh, is dealt with publicly, and I'm really pleased that Vancouver is leading the way in Canada to, to tackle this. We know that every other city is also uh, dealing with the, the problem, but hasn't taken this uh, step, so I think it's going to be a robust discussion when it comes, and I look forward to that. Thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor DiGenova. I know. I had a few questions, uh, follow-ups. I was also hoping that you could bring the information to public hearing as to how many of these current shops uh, that are operating uh, have unfortunately uh, been the victim of robberies or have have had criminal activity uh, that's concerning to the public. I think that that's something we certainly have gotten emails about all of us at City Council and something that concerns me and also I'm wondering and this is perhaps a, a question for the VPD right now in the absence of any rules or regulations and while this is closed off for public hearing if that is indeed where it goes is there special attentions paid to the shops that are operating very close to schools I know we just received an email from a citizen who's very concerned that there is a, a marijuana shop that's opening right across the street from a school uh, in East Vancouver near the East Village so I'm just wondering if the police department is paying special attention to those shops located right across from schools and then I'm also wondering uh, within this regulatory process uh, are we allowing sort of if if people do pass all of these regulations are they allowed to have more than one license will there be certain organizations or companies that have a monopoly on the market whether that's a non-profit or a for-profit business and I'm just wondering what about other illegal substances so uh, after this regulatory framework let's say it is set up uh, would the city of Vancouver ever entertain regulating other substances that are deemed illegal as per marijuana? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, thank you, Councillor DiGenova and Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you no very words. much. I just had two other quick questions. Uh, one was, uh, we spent a lot of time in here talking about drug addiction and treatments and everything. Do we have a number uh, that the city actually spends on uh, drug issues in, in the community, uh, treatment of youth, et cetera. If we can find that number, that would be great. Uh, just in terms of putting into perspective the situation that we find now. Now, sir, are you, are you referring to what the, our partners spend? Because I think you know that the city has no jurisdiction over drug treatment. We, we do spend money related to mental health and addictions. Yes. But it's not treatment. I'm, that's what I'm speaking about, mental health and addictions. The, the amount of dollars that we either grant or uh, to, to our partners or that we spend on this issue uh, because I think there, there is some kind of balance here. Now, given the fact that right now in many of these organizations do require prescriptions from doctors, uh, patients who are in pain are charged for these prescriptions, they bring them in to a retail outlet, but in a way it's fraudulent for the patient because they're still involved in an illegal activity, which makes it difficult for, for, for them. So one of the questions that's come to me from a number of areas is, as lawmakers here at the City of Vancouver, uh, when we say by doing this before the federal government actually does legalize marijuana, uh, how can we feel that, that our citizens will uphold our laws? 
So we're saying a federal law isn't important, you don't have to obey it. Then why do we expect that either people running this or the citizens will actually uphold our laws? So that's my last question. And yeah, just in your rationale, you know. For sure. Thanks, Councillor. I mean, I think for, for us, any law making government, you know, has to, in, in order for people to comply, usually it's based on, you know, they, they understand the rationale and they understand the consequences if they don't. So but we'll, we'll see if we can fill that out a bit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I have Councillor Reimer last on the queue. Um, I just had a couple of questions that arose as a result of uh, other questions people have asked. Um, so first up, the courts have ruled that we have a right, citizens have a right of access to medical marijuana, although I keep hearing it referred to as illegal, so it would be helpful for me at the public hearing to have clarity around the legal status of medical marijuana. <laughs> Sorry. Um, second, um, Councillor DiGenova asked for some information about criminal activity. I'm trying to think of exactly the words you used, but uh, whether or not there'd been robberies, I think, at the dispensaries. I would be interested to know how many pharmacies were targeted in the same time period, so we have some comparative baseline on it. Um, I'm personally interested in pharmacies, but um, whatever, it's something that gives us a baseline because there is, uh, you know, ongoing issues around uh, property crime in the city. Uh, and the last one, there is a case, so we talked about, um, dispensaries that have moved in across from schools. There's at least one case that I'm aware of where a school made a conscious choice to move across from a dispensary that had been operating for quite a long time. Um, so if the school were willing to provide some information about why they made that decision, um, is the private school at Commercial and 14th, 15th, across from the Compassion Club, it would be useful for me to know both why they would actively choose to move across from a dispensary that's been there for coming up on 20 years now, um, as well as what their experience has been, because, you know, they would have had a long relationship across the street from each other. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, and uh, Councillor Diogenova, you're back on the queue. And Mr. I'd Mayor, thank you. I was just hoping that one of those questions I had asked for one of them to be answered today, if possible, as this will be closed off for public hearing. I was just wondering sort of if uh, the police are taking any action to actively monitor those uh, current dispensaries that are across from schools or near to schools. So I was just hoping that that could be answered because that's a concern that's come to all of us here through our correspondence. Thank you. So, uh, Council, I think it's fair to say that we're doing our best to monitor all of these um, various outlets and when we have notification that a new one has set up shop, uh, we dispatch our, our bylaw enforcement folks to have a first look. So yes, we are, we're, we're looking at them all and we're looking at them from uh, their relationship to schools. And as I said, if, if we have uh, one that's newly opened and they're near a school, we're very, very clear, you know, you've, you've got to understand that there, there's a chance that councillors consider going to consider a regulatory framework that would make this location not possible for you. Um, I think the VPD are, are a big part of our cross-disciplinary approach and, you know, they're very attuned, obviously, to the youth, uh, youth risks and I think um, Mr. Porteous clearly outlined that, you know, they, they will enforce if they think they're, these uh, retail businesses are actually inappropriately engaging youth. So it's, we're doing it. Uh, it's very active. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, that is all for uh, our speaking queue. Um, so thank you to uh, Dr. Baum, to uh, Dr. Daly, and to our all the staff team from City and BPD uh, for your support bringing this forward. And uh, we need to move now to the question decision on the motion, as moved by Councillor Jang. Uh, the recommendations to refer this to public hearing. And uh, I will pull up the queue, voting queue here. So council can now vote on the motion. Okay, the votes are in. 11 total votes, 10 in favor and one opposed. Councillor Ball opposed.
Okay, and we have concluded uh, on that report reference. That item will be referred to public hearing. Uh, coming back to Council soon with uh, answers to the many questions that have been posed, uh, important questions on this issue. And again, a big thanks to our staff and um, all the work that went into preparing for today and the work that will go into preparation for that public hearing.